Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, we're preparing to go live here. I'll have to probably edit this tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just want to catch myself because if the sound echoes, you know, um, doesn't appear to be live yet. Some place. Okay. It said it's live and yet nothing popped up for YouTube. It's saying it on mine that it's live yeah, on YouTube it's now. It's on mine too, but normally the video like pops up. Oh yeah. <laughs> there we are. We're live. Yeah. Okay. So welcome everybody to uh, the Irish American Heritage Museum. If I can get back to my own script or to my own monitor. Uh, and we're back with Dr. Damien Shields, um, who I, I forgot to even ask you. It's the middle of the night where you are you're you're not in uh, ireland or america <laughs> no currently so, in finland yeah in yeah, finland yeah yeah so it's yeah. about three o'clock in the morning is it? <laughs> no 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 it's not even it's not even 1 a.m yet it's early oh, good. okay well <laughs> so yeah thank you for staying up so late um, and you're here tonight to talk to us about your new research project the civil war blue jackets uh, and you, this is basically you're transcribing the muster rolls from these civil wars, um, which had about 118,000 men who fought for the Union, and at least you reckon 20% of this uh, Union Navy were Irish born. So tonight you're going to talk about what you know life was like for these volunteers, um, how this project is you know happening, and what people can do to help you. And um, we're very excited to hear. So thank you again, David, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to share your own screen. Thanks, thanks a million, Elizabeth. It's great to be back, <laughs> and, and thanks for um, allowing us to come on um, to chat about um, Civil War Blue Jackets. I'll just share my screen here fully. Hopefully, you will be able to see this. Um, are we good there? Yeah. Cool. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks a million for coming. Um, yeah, so... I'm here to talk about a, a project that we started. It, it kind of really kicked off in September. Um, and one of the main reasons we want to give talks about this and, and tell people all about it is, A, because we think it's an incredibly exciting project, both in terms of what it can tell us about the um, American Civil War, but also generally kind of working class, poor people's lives in the mid-19th century um, through the lens of the US Navy records, which are probably the best and most complete digitized set of records relating to the American Civil War. So significantly easier, significantly more of these records are digitized than, say, the Army records, um, mainly because they're smaller groups um, and they just have a huge amount of potential, which, which I'm going to discuss a bit um, tonight. But the key elements of the project are this crowdsourced element, which Elizabeth was mentioning. So it Essentially, we have citizen scientists, volunteers who are coming um, on board with the project, who are helping us out in transcribing muster sheets, which I'll go through what these are and why it's important and, and how you can um, participate if you're interested. And there's going to be a very specific Irish slant throughout the whole um, talk, particularly given um, given where we are, if you like, <laughs> where, we're, where we're talking. Um, and I've had a long standing interest in the Irish in the, in the Union Navy in any event. So I'll, I'll be sharing some of my favorite stories with you, but also some some of what we can tell from these records because of these records, the type of information we can get about these people. Um, so to kind of give you a slight uh, introduction to the project, we're a AHRC, an Arts and Humanities Research Council, as it's called in the United Kingdom funded project. So it's based out of Northumbria University. The principal investigator there is Professor David Gleeson. You may well know David. David is actually from Tipperary um, and is, is the leading expert on the Irish in the South. So his two main books are The Irish in the South um, and The Irish in the Confederate Wars, the blue uh, are the green and the grey, rather. Um, and so I'm working with David in Northumbria on this project, but we're part of, of an international team, if you like. We have information scientists from the University of Sheffield and Koblenz Landau, um, and we're partnering with groups such as the United States Naval Academy Museum in the US. 
And what we're trying to do is to look at these recently dis digitized muster sheets. They are held in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and they um, were digitized as part of a project called Old Weather, which was looking at, um, by NOAA, looking at um, weather entries um, from the 19th century. But these roles are the lists of the men who served on the U.S. vessels during the American Civil War. And they're highly detailed. They contain an awful lot of fascinating information that I'm going to show you in a second. And our aim is to use citizen science, to use the power of public transcription to, digit, to get a record of all of these muster sheets, all the information that's contained on them, and to create a freely available database so that you will be able to go and do things like say, I want to know everybody who was in the US Navy who was from County Kerry, and you will be able to pull that information up. We're looking to do other things with that information though as well. I was mentioning that the naval records are among the most complete in terms of digitization. So not only do we have the muster sheets, we have the enlistment rendezvous reports from when we walked into the enlistment um, rendezvous in New York City, for example, and signed up. They're digitized. We have the pension files of men who survived are digitized and claim pensions. We have the pension files of widows and dependents, men who lost their lives in the Navy during the war and who died subsequently. We also have the files of people who applied for pensions but didn't receive them. So we have a huge amount of different information. That's only some of it. We have hospital case files that have been digitized, men who, who, who needed to get medical attention during the war. Um, so all of these different elements. And this database in the end, we hope, is going to tie all of these people together and all of these different records so that you'll be able to find out more about them. And as I was saying a few moments ago, because the Navy pulled in an awful lot of poor, particularly urban people, um, people living in urban areas. You get a lot of immigrants in it. You also get a lot of African-Americans in it. Um, in the South, you get an awful lot of people who had been enslaved, who were joining directly into the Navy. They, they were called contrabands often in the contemporary um, Civil War records. All these people are kind of the, the people that we don't see very much. Um, leaving, a, leaving a major trace in the historical record, but they are here in the naval records. And that's one of the really exciting elements of it. Um, so I'm going to show you a bit about the muster sheet. I should say, as well as um, creating that database, we are hoping, the information science team are hoping to use the data that is created by our citizen scientists to try and train computers to help them to read 19th century writing. So the intention there is that we would have something that really has significant longevity beyond just Civil War blue jackets. The information scientists are working away. And every time somebody enters something, uh, transcribes an element on Zooniverse, they take that information and they're inputting that into computer software that they're trying to develop in order to help machines to read this handwriting, which would be really, really useful for historical projects um, all along the way. So the project is going to run for three years. Um, we, we kicked off just earlier this year the um, Zooniverse page, and I'll be explaining Zooniverse a little later on, but where, where the transcription take place was launched in September. Um, and as well as all this public-facing um, databases, we are going to be doing things like doing a conference on what we discover. We're going to be writing a book, a new, a new history of the common sailor in the Civil War, and have a significant number of different outputs through the course of the project. Um, and again, I'll be telling you about some of them. We're, we're putting stuff out every week at the moment on our site, civilwarbluejackets.com on the blog. Um, and it's it's just a constant, constant discoveries nearly every week from our volunteers. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna show you the muster sheets and tell you what exactly they, they actually are now in a moment. Um, I'm then gonna move on and just talk generally a bit, just some, overview of the Irish in the Navy and a couple of my favorite stories if you like, from Irish involvement in the Navy, a couple of the people you should know and the stories you should know in relation to the Irish in the Navy. Then we're going to have a look at a couple of case studies of what looking at these muster sheets can reveal about Irish specifically. But you'll see, you'll see 
when we're looking at that, it's obvious relevance to all groups, but we're, we're, we're particularly interested in the Irish here tonight. Um, and then um, the, the meat, if you like, at the end is how you can help having a look directly at the Zooniverse where we are um, transcribing these documents and showing you how it works and how you can keep up to date. So what are these muster roles? Well, this is what they are. This is how they look. Um, you can see here, this is a single page of a muster roll from a ship that was a monitor class vessel. It was an ironclad river monitor called the USS Onondaga. This is taken in 1864. And it is a quarterly report. So it's supposed to be every three months, quarterly report of the crew who are serving on specific vessels. OK, so you can immediately in your in your mind's eye start to think of, OK, well, if I can get all this sort of information for all these vessels through the course of the war, what sort of things can I do with that type of big data, as we would call it? So it's um, you can see there's quite a few entries here. Hopefully you can see my red arrow, but the um, you can see all these different entries. Individual sailors are one line each and all of this information is specific information about one sailor. And if we zoom in and just have a look at some of that information, this is just a, a zoom in. We can see here the ship's number. This is a number that each sailor who went onto a ship was assigned so that they could effectively be given a duty roster. So instead of it saying John Ashcroft, this is the man's name here, was on watch, it would say number 91 is part of this watch. But then it gives the man's name a significant piece of information, obviously, um, that we want to record. Their rating, so this is effectively their rank, and you can tell an awful lot about this. So landsman here was the lowest rank that you would come in at. So it's somebody who, who had um, no maritime experience, effectively, a landlubber. So John Ashcraft, uh, Ashcraft has no experience um, that we know of. OK, so date of enlistment, we, we know when he enlists. We know where he enlists, 1862 Philadelphia. We know how long he enlists for. We know where he was received from. And here in North Carolina, you see North Carolina actually isn't a state it, in this instance. It's, a, it's what's called a receiving ship. It's effectively a stationary vessel where men who had just been recruited were trained up in the essentials, if you like, the bare necessities of naval um, service before they were assigned to a ship. Um, if we continue here, it goes on um, for other bits of information. Um, where born, a really important one, particularly if you're, for example, interested in Irish service. In this instance, we see it's Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where he's a citizen of. Here you can see John Ashcraft is 16 years old, right? So the age is recorded. If they had an occupation, their prior occupation is recorded. This is incredibly important from, a, if you like, a working class perspective as to what these men were doing before they come in. How many of them were sailors? How many of them were, were maritime specialists, if you like? How many of them were just down on their luck? And then we have detailed um, descriptions of their eyes, their hair, their complexion, their height. Here on this second person, you can see one of the, I, I would say, the um, most important, really, group that we're, that we're going to learn about in terms of what it's going to tell us from a, a, a low base of knowledge, and that's the African American sailor. So, th this African American sailor um, was born in Charleston, South Carolina, and you can see his description is just put in here as mulatto. All right, so we're going to be able to tell an awful lot about African American service from these. And the very last entry you'll see here, and again, we'll be touching on this in a little while, is Ramar. Um, anything to add, effectively. Um, so here it says about our first guy, John Ashcroft, that he has a cross mark on his right temple. So these are descriptive terms, and uh, you'll see an awful lot of interesting um, bits of information. And again, as I say, we look at them in specific relation to the Irish in a few minutes. But I did want to um, make a note of the fact that you will all be celebrating, well, any of you who are in the United States at the moment, which I presume is the majority of you, will shortly be imminently celebrating Thanksgiving. Um, and this ship has a Thanksgiving theme, this page. Um, and I would um, 
draw your attention to this extract from this same page. This man here called, referred to as Michael Callahan. He's actually Callan and is his real name. The, you see here in his rank 2CF, that actually stands for second class fireman. So he's a guy who works down in the engines where they're putting coal and stuff. Coal heavers are throwing coal into the fire. Firemen are monitoring it. He enlisted just a few months before this muster was taken um, for one year. It just says he was from Ireland and he was a 32-year-old labourer. But we actually know an awful lot more about Michael because Michael wrote letters. And Michael wrote letters to New York, to the New York Irish American Weekly, which was the main ethnic newspaper in New York City. He didn't use his real name. He signed his name Gary Owen which gives you a hint as to where he was from. You get top marks for anyone who has guessed where he was from on the basis of Gary Owen. Um, but he, he was from Limerick City. It's a well-known part of Limerick City. And also, of course, a famous military song that becomes even more famous um, thanks to a certain George Armstrong Custer. But Michael, just a couple of weeks after this muster was um, taken, writes a letter back from the James River in G Virginia where he is serving. So at the, at, at the sharp end of things in 1864, um, and he's writing about their Thanksgiving celebrations. So it gives you a bit of an idea, and I thought it'd be appropriate given where we are um, to, to read that out so, so that you can see how Thanksgiving was celebrated by Irish sailors in 1864. So this is what he writes. 28th of November is his letter from Dutch Gap on the James River. We had our Thanksgiving festival and indeed, the patriotic parties who are instrumental in getting it up are deserving of more than an ordinary share of praise for the creditable manner in which the affair was managed, as we received an abundance of turkeys and sea, which made the birth deck resemble a poultry market on a small scale. After all being served, the work of dissecting commenced. The cooks pulled off their coats and rolled up their sleeves, transferred the gobblers to the upper deck, and went through the process of immersion in the James with the said gobblers. On Thanksgiving morning, the galley was the centre of attraction. Roasting, baking, boiling, stewing, and all the paraphernalia of the culinary department brought into requisition under full headway. At the usual time, eight bells announced dinner, when there was a simultaneous attack on the enemy. Talk about storming the enemy's works and taking them by assault. But the attack on the defenceless gobblers throws Sherman's flanking movements in the shade. For in less time than it takes to tell it, they had all disappeared before the terrible onslaught of the sturdy sons of Neptune. And thus was fought the great battle of Thanksgiving on the James. So you can see that uh, Michael had a bit of a humorous streak in him there, um, re re referencing their attack on their Thanksgiving turkeys. No doubt to be replicated in homes up and down the United States it, 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 imminently. Um, it, the second part of that letter actually goes on. The Confederates do fire on them in real. They really fire on them later that day, um, and a vessel is sunk. So, so it gives you gives you a bit of an idea of the, the kind of two sides of the war. But just an interesting um, little snapshot of one Irish sailor's Thanksgiving in 1864. I wanted to give a very quick kind of highlights real of some of the important aspects about Irish service in the US Navy and why it's so important. It's it's probably the war in which more Irishmen are serving in the Navy than any other in modern history. Um, th there's huge numbers of them. So of the, and Elizabeth was mentioning this, circa 118,000 men who serve in the Union Navy, somewhere in the region of 23 and a half thousand of them, or 20%, are thought to be Irish born. But that doesn't tell all the story. I've done other work um, that shows that the Navy has a very high rate of Irish people not being marked as born in Ireland for various reasons. Um, and then you have to add in what you would call ethnic Irish Americans. So Irish who are born to US, uh, born in the US to Irish parents, born in Canada to Irish parents, born in Britain to Irish parents who then subsequently emigrate, but will see themselves as very strongly a part of the ethnically Irish community. So when we're adding those type of figures into it, certainly we're in the region of one in four as an estimate. One of the things that we're hoping to get out at the end of, of uh, the Civil War Blue Jackets, and which we should get, is, is a much more accurate picture of just how many there are in it. 
but these are the type of figures we're talking about. So huge numbers of Irish. Um, and they don't get very much attention, particularly they pale in comparison to things like, for example, the Irish Brigade or Battles of Gettysburg or things we were talking about. Um, one of the, the least remembered guys is this fella here who's a Dubliner called Commander Stephen Rowan. And he's the high, highest ranking Irish man who served in the U.S. Navy during the war. And he played an incredibly prominent role in it. He was in command of a vessel called the USS Pawnee that was given a, a role among, uh, along with a couple of other ships to um, relieve the garrison of Fort Sumter in 1861. The, the attempted relief effort to precipitate the Confederate firing on the fort and started the American Civil War. And Stephen Rowan was there in command of one of the vessels. He played a really prominent part as well um, in North Carolina. Um, any of you who might have heard of, of um, Burnside campaign in and around Carolina, Rowan was very heavily involved in that. A fairly stellar career that ended up with him um, in, as an admiral um, in, in the post-war years, but very, very little known about um, um, in an Irish service context. Um, any of you who are interested in, for example, the Medal of Honor, um, the single day that saw the most awards to Irishmen of the Medal of Honor resulted in from this battle, um, which is also my screensaver on my on my computer. This is the Battle of Mobile Bay in Alabama on the fifth of August, eighteen sixty four. Um, it's thought there is dispute over one of the individuals, but there it's thought that fourteen Medal of Honors were awarded to Irish-born men. Um, as a result of that engagement, which effectively closed the port of Mobile to the Confederacy. Um, one of them was this man here. This is Richard Dunphy. Um, and Richard Dunphy um, was serving on the flagship, the USS Hartford. Um, and you can see here some of the consequences of his service there. His arms were carried off by a shell. And Richard was awarded the Medal of Honor. His life has an incredibly sad postscript. He moves west, um, where he he, he suffers very badly, a uh, very traumatic um, post-war life. Struggles to cope with the fact that that he he doesn't have his arms anymore. He loses them as a young man, um, and there, there's there's um, abuse, um, alcoholism, and a really sad few decades for Richard Dunphy, who pays a very high price. Um, he and his family for his um, his wounds as a result of the Civil War. I couldn't possibly be discussing the U.S. Navy or talk of um, Irish in the U.S. Navy without talking about the USS Kearsarge, which is this um, vessel down on the bottom left. The Kearsarge is a fascinating vessel because Kearsarge spent a lot of time going around um, particularly European waters, hunting for a very famous Confederate ship, the CSS Alabama a Commerce Raider that was attacking US ships. And in late 1863, the USS Kearsarge drops anchor in the port of Queenstown, which is Cove now in County Cork. And at the time, it was illegal to recruit British subjects into foreign military. Right. And Irish people at that period were British subjects. But that didn't really bother the Kearsarge. Um, a lot of her crew were Irish and the men immediately spread out around Cork, many of them going home, um, recruiting numbers. And, and Union vessels do this. And so you see some quite exotic countries represented in muster sheets of Union vessels, which is really quite fascinating. Um, for example, we recently found a man from Africa serving um, on the Mississippi River in the American Civil War. But um, in the case of the Kearsarge, the Kearsarge um, recruits about 16 Irish guys from in and around Cork, and they sail off back on the hunt for the Kearsarge. Not realizing, of course, that in Queenstown, there was a Confederate spy, um, a lieutenant captain who had served in the Confederate Army. Um, but had returned to Ireland to keep an eye on Union recruitment efforts there. And of course, he immediately reported the incident. The British went off their heads about it. And it caused a major diplomatic incident. And so as the Keir Sarge is heading um, on its merry way towards the coast of France, um, there's frantic messages being sent to them saying, you have to bring these men back. There's a major problem. Um, and so the Keir Sarge fabricates um, and this is actually, just first time I'm showing these images, 
these are from some research I was doing a few years ago. This is actually from the log. Um, th this has since been digitized. So again, this is another link in these mass chains that we're talking about in the Navy. It wasn't digitized when I originally took this photo. You can see that the Kearsarge captain fabricates that the 16 strangers had stowed away on board the vessel because they don't want to say that they they um, illegally recruited them. So they have to bring these men back. They're all dropped back off in Queenstown um, and they're put on trial. It's the first trial, um, which some really interesting information in it. Um, but one man is not given back. And he was a guy called Michael Ahern, who was a clerk. Um, who had been unemployed in Queenstown. He had lost his job a little while before, before the Keir Sarge came calling. And Michael Ahern, because of his skills, I suppose, in, in bookkeeping, was kept on board. And he was there when the Keir Sarge finally caught up with the Alabama and sunk her. Um, and Michael Ahern, this is another record, the paymaster, Stuart, belonging to the Keir Sarge, where she destroyed the Alabama off Cherbourg, is being commended for his service. Michael Ahern receives the Medal of Honor for that action, having almost certainly never set foot in the United States in his entire life. So it gives you this kind of fascinating insight of, of the intrigues of the International um, Navy during the American Civil War. OK, so I want to go and talk a bit more about some of the some of what we can tell um, from these records. And we did a pilot study originally for Civil War Blue Jackets where we looked at vessels called the, the city class ironclads, um, nicknamed Pook Turtles because of their appearance and after designer, a guy called Samuel Pook. And there were seven of these built early in the war and they serve on the Mississippi and her tribu tributaries. If any of you have been, ever been to Vicksburg, one of them is actually on display there. It was raised in the 60s, USS Cairo is on display and you can have a look at it. But the seven, seven of them served, they served a place like Fort Henry in Donaldson, um, Island Number 10. They ran past the batteries at Vicksburg, very, very famous vessels in the Mississippi. Um, but we um, did a pilot project where we recorded all of their muster rolls, every single person who served on the surviving muster rolls of those vessels. And I wanted to just look at the Carondelet because you can see something really interesting happening here um, that, number one, makes us think about the ship community on each individual ship. We look at the Navy as a whole and we say, oh, 20 percent of the Navy is Irish and 15 percent of the Navy is African-American. But that wasn't the way it was on each vessel. Some had more, some had less. And begin to think about what impact that has on how people interact with each other um, about their wartime experience. And if we just have a look at this. Um, we can, oh, I should go previous, sorry. Um, I'll do that. Yeah, this is just showing you the changes through time of the must, of the um, ethnic um, and nativity breakdown on um, the Carondelet. And you can, we can do this because it's telling us where these men are born. And so you can see in this earlier part of the war, the dominance of this red is white native born American men, nearly half the crew, nearly one in five are African American. You can see though, there's not that many Irish, right? 6% are Irish. There's a bit of a mix of other um, British and Canadian. And as we begin to move through time, we begin to see the Irish grow. We begin to see the African American grow and we begin to see the native born white American um, contingent decrease until as we're approaching kind of the last 18 months to two years of the war, we're in a, in a situation where about one in five of these crew are born in Ireland. OK, so, and you see here the last um, sheet from that sequence. So we looked at all these vessels and not all of them show the same information, but um, there there is a broadly kind of higher level of Europeans coming in in many of these vessels. Some of them have 40% African-Americans on their crew in 1865. Others have only 5%. These are the same vessels built to the same specifications. They serve in the same areas of the war. So you're asking a lot of questions about why that is. Um, and you see, particularly in the Mississippi, you do see this jump in the numbers of Irish as the war progresses. 
pretty interesting to consider when you think that the Irish are supposed to have stopped in Mistin if you if you follow um, uh, so, some of the standard um, thoughts about it after things like the Emancipation Proclamation was brought in after 1863. But are Irish men enlisting in the Navy in this period to try and avoid army service, where it, which was a lot deadlier? Um, so, so you have a lot of these things if they're... Uh, that are mulling around your head as to why these sort of things um, might be occurring. But these are the sort of charts that are, are kicking us off in relation to this. And you're immediately thinking about things like, what is that Irish contingent? How do they relate to each other? How do they relate to the native-born white Americans? How do they relate to the African Americans who they have a historically bad um, relationship with in this period? So, all of that um, is what comes out of the muster sheets. And at the end of all of this, we should be able to do this for every three months on every one of these surviving musters across the entire fleet for, for those vessels um, where they survive. So it should be really significant in telling us how these vessels changed through time um, and how they differed from one to the other and what their communities might have been like on board. Here's another one of the vessels. You can see the, the Louisville here, very similar. To the Carondelet. Um, this is its true time, its full 1862 to 1865, the breakdown of nationalities and a, a breakdown of, F, of nativities, rather. Um, 315 United States. Um, and you can see then that significantly ahead, if you like, of others is, is the Irish with 61. Um, and, and to this, we would have to add some of these uh, American born, some of the English born, some of the Scottish born would be Irish American, right? So you can see their their prominence um, on the Louisville. But there's always a sprinkling of Scandinavians. Um, you get a, a, always some Germans, though they don't serve in anything like the same numbers as they do in the army. Um, really interesting um, things coming through. So some of the Scandinavians that were seen early on tend to be more um seafaring they're 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 um professional mariners a lot of these guys appear to be um, not something that you're seeing necessarily with for example the irish so they're probably enlisting for different reasons i was mentioning the remark section um a little while ago um and this is the type of thing that the remarks section um facilitates um the remark section is also included in the enlistments rendezvous, which are also um, digitized and which will also be in Lincoln. So when men first enlist, and this is some analysis that was carried out of everybody who was born in Ireland who enlisted in New York City in July of 1863, so the month of the New York draft riots. And most of these uh, records were taken to identify men um, in case you know they they tried to run away or for any other reason. But it gives us this incredible information about their bodies um, and what they had either inked on it or what had occurred to them um, as a result of their lives. And so um, these are some um, maps that we did up of where men scars were, were recorded on men's faces, where burns were recorded on men's faces. A lot of these guys are working in very dangerous, um, heavy machinery sort of employment. Um, which was very, very um, risky. Smallpox, the impact of smallpox is something that you consistently see the scarring of men's faces. Um, other medical, um, which has an unfortunate uh, uh, occurrence around the groin area that we won't go into in any more detail um, here. But uh, one that I'm very interested in is tattoos, because consistently um, you'll see um, tattoos recorded, not so much early in the war, um, on the muster rolls, but you do see them quite frequently late in the war um, in the remarks section. And they can tell you an awful lot. Um, men are getting crucifixes tattooed on them. Men are getting anchors tattooed on them, which you know is hardly surprising for, for maritime men. Um, but they're getting their initials, which is a form of identity disc, if you like. It's an early form of identity disc is to get your initials tattooed on you. But sometimes the initials don't match the man's name. And we do know that quite a, quite a number of men chose to go into the Civil War uh, Navy under aliases, under assumed names, for, for various reasons. Um, one, of, one of the ways you might get a hint of it is if the initials don't match the name he's enlisted under. Um, women are a popular one. Um, you also see things like um, um, 
um, eagles, um, um, liberty and everything, are these symbols of liberty. But what I'm particularly interested in that you, you see a lot coming out of these working class lads in places like New York is fire um, company and ladder company tattoos. Tattoos that can be traced back to individual en engine and ladder companies in New York City. Uh, and effectively, we know in this period that these engine and ladder companies were, were running almost like gangs at that period. Um, and they were significantly important in the political scene in New York. Um, and uh, you have young boys, one of the one of the men represented, and this is a young boy who's just a teenager um, who appears to be a runner for one of these fire um, companies, but they're so um, tied to them that they're tattooing their allegiance, their fire company allegiance to their arms in this period. Uh, it, remember, at this period, it wasn't a professional service. It becomes a professional service just afterwards. Um, and it's a very, very, very um, heavily associated with the Irish in this period. Um, so really interesting what tattoos can tell you about working class social life in urban areas. Um, like those um, in many parts of New York State. Okay, I want to just look at a couple of what, what we can then tell from these records on a more personal level. Um, and one of the guys we look at, it, uh, to return to the Carondelet, we were looking at the pie charts of the Carondelet, looking at the Irish proportion of their crew increase through time. And I was speculating as to what does that mean in terms of how the Irish interact with themselves and other people. Well, the Navy records can give us some insight into that, too. And this is uh, one of the Carondelet's crew, a guy called James Carey. He was a quarter gunner on the, the boat. He was in his mid-20s when he enlisted. He was recorded as a sailor on the muster sheet. So we know that he, he, he had some maritime experience. And so we did what we will be doing with everyone, we hope, link his naval records um, across the full range of digitized material. Um, and we found a pension record relating to James. Um, unfortunately, he did not survive the war. He was fishing out a uh, Confederate torpedo, effectively a, a Civil War mine, um, which exploded. And he died of his wounds on the 1st of October, 1863. But the pension file that resulted just exposed this huge amount of detail about his background and also about his relationship with his crewmates. We even know where in Ireland his family were from because we have the marriage um, record. His parents, Brian Carey and Bridget Kelly, were married in Horsleap, County Offaly, in 1838. Uh, they move over to Philadelphia, where fathers, uh, where James's father, Brian when they landed, secured work as a labourer working along the riverfront, loading and unloading vessels, goods, coal, sand, hoop poles and sea. He was effectively a stevedore. Again, a, another profession, another trade that would have a significant Irish uh, representation um, through this period. But it was hard work and Brian, Brian's body consistently um, started to, 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 to feel the strain until eventually... He could only become a day laborer. He could only get work on a day to day occasional basis. And that forces his son, James, to become more of a breadwinner in the house. And James does this, like a lot of other men, by going oyster fishing from Philadelphia. Um, James does it. Um, on the boats of fellow Irish American Philip Fitzpatrick. So you can see they're keeping it within the family. Um, and sometimes they got good catches, so they could earn up to $30 a month if, if times were good. But when these oyster men, when the war came, these oyster men were really, really useful to the Union. And a significant number of them, and again, you can see this in the naval records, go west to serve on the Mississippi. Um, and James is one of those guys. So we can see how his his where his parents chose to emigrate, where his father chose to work, where he grows up and where he gets employed, the impact that has on him going into the U.S. Navy. But what's really interesting in terms of the crew is what happens to James after he dies. And we have these documents that are recorded in his pension file. This one in the center is the price of embalming his body, paying for a coffin and sending it all the way from 
the war zone back to the tenement house in Philadelphia, where his parents are. And you can see it's $176.50. An itemized, fascinating document. But this was an extraordinary thing to, to occur for someone serving on a U.S. Navy um, boat. And so it immediately raises the question, well, he, he was clearly held in extremely high regard um, by his shipmates. But more than that, um, and you see this quite a lot in this period, um, that when men gave money, they like to have their names listed with the amount of money they gave. And so the names are also included here. You see it on the right. You can see the different values of $20 all the way down to 2 and $3. And because we have the muster sheets, we can analyze these guys and see, well, who are these fellas? And when you look at it, it's really interesting. There's 49 officers and men who gave money for James Carey's body to come back. The three who gave the most had a similar rank to him. They were petty officers and they worked in areas closely to him. A Pennsylvanian called James Roberts, who was captain of the forecastle. Um, a German, um, Frederick Steinmeier, captain of the hold, and a guy from Queenstown or Cove, County Cork, gunner John Evans, who gave $20. Of the rest, the vast majority are Irish or Irish American, right? So it's giving you a sense of who his closest relationships were. They were with the petty officers, um, who he was working very closely with. And then they were with that group of Irish Americans, largely, who were the ones who said, we are going to dip in our own pockets to send this guy home. So it's given you just that in, these ships are tiny little ships, really, in the scale of things. People are all shoved in together cheek by jowl, but little discrete communities that overlap with each other are forming um, throughout. Um, I'll just give a slight postscript to that. Um, story because his father, who was illiterate, Brian, actually um, leaves a quote in it um, of the moment he found out that his son had been killed in 1863. Um, he says it in a really matter of fact fashion, which is pretty common among um, how um, illiterate people described events like this. But he said he, he was, and I quote, he was at Gloucester wheeling coal onto a vessel as he distinctly remembers the day he got word of his son's death. So that's pretty, pretty um, harrowing stuff, but still working away, still working on the docks as a day laborer when somebody comes and tell him that his son um, has died. Letters are things that we come across quite, quite a lot of um, as well in the records. Um, and I, I just want to read out one um, relating to James Duffy. James is an Irish American. He was born in New York to Irish immigrant parents. Um, he was born there in 1844, lived on the Lower East Side in New York City. Um, he was 20 in 1864, earning $10 a week helping his elderly parents when he enlists in the Navy. And he ends up on this vessel on the right here. This isn't a photo of him, by the way, on the left. It's just a photo of a young man in the Navy. Um, we don't have too many photos of Irish um, in in the in the U.S. Navy during this period, but he serves on the USS Ticonderoga, um, and he is off Wilmington um, when Wilmington, which was a uh, significant um, uh, Confederate um, port um, where blockade runners were running into. Um, when the effort to close, the first effort to close Wilmington and the Battle of Fort Fisher, the first Battle of Fort Fisher is fought on Christmas Eve, uh, 1864. Um, and just to recount for you, the Ticonderoga's captain, Charles Steedman, gave the order to commence firing at Fort Fisher shortly after 2.30 p.m. on 24th of December, 1864. Landsman James Duffy was assist assisting with the operation of one of the ship's 100-pounder Parrot Rifles. At around 3.15, 45 minutes into the action, Acting Lieutenant Louis G. Vassallo was standing at the gun breach in the act of sighting the weapon when suddenly it erupted into fragments, sending huge shards of red-hot metal flying about the ship. Somehow Vassallo survived but with severe facial injuries. Many of his comrades were not so lucky. James Duffy was one of them. He never knew much about the explosion. The ship's surgeon would later recall that the young man's head and arm was blown off 
by the violence of the blast. This is all information that his family um, probably discovered as well. A total of eight sailors were killed and 12 wounded when the barrel burst. Many of them were Irish. But the captain of the vessel sat down to write to Francis Duffy, the elderly immigrant father. Um, um, and I'll read it for you. USS Ticonderoga, off North Carolina, December the 31st, 1864. My dear sir, it becomes my painful duty to inform you of the death of your son, Francis Duffy, who was killed on the 24th instant by the accidental twisting of a gun during the attack upon Fort Fisher. In the midst of sorrow, comfort and strength cometh only from above. Yet it is gratifying to know that he died while gallantly performing his duty in battle. I am, dear sir, your obedient servant, Charles Steedman, Captain. So you can get a whole you can get a whole series of letters. In fact, and we have them for a number of sailors um, that that they've written during the conflict, not thinking that um, they, they would die. Of course, most of them don't die; they survive uh, and give really fascinating details, often about their lives in the decades after the war as well. All of it to be uncovered and all of it can be linked through the muster sheets. And so I'll just spend the last um, few minutes looking at Zooniverse and telling you what Zooniverse is and how you can get involved. Um, we're really keen to get as many volunteers as we can. We're, we're kind of running a big campaign to do that. So um, even if you if you don't think it's for you, if you think of anyone um, who, who you think might be interested, we'd be very keen for them um to be told about it and um potentially jump on board but the zooniverse is a um a huge platform it's about 1.2 million universe uh, 1.2 million users um and it's a citizen science platform and it's uh, to allow citizen scientists to engage in scientific projects um a lot of the zooniverse stuff started off um with things like looking at the space photographs um, and trying to identify things like galaxies in them but you're getting more and more humanities and history projects on them, particularly centered around transcribing um, mass data. So where you have thousands of documents that it would never be possible for just a couple of people to ever do where you can put them out. Um, and that is what we're trying to do with the muster sheets. And so we developed this page. You can see here the Civil War Blue Jackets page, um, um, which you, you can visit. And look at the muster sheets and you can see where we are um our statistics we have just over 650 volunteers um our completion rate is looking good 10 percent but i would have to to hazard we have a long way to go because the only vessels we have uploaded so far are those that begin with the letter a so we've plenty plenty of, uh, of of a distance to go um but this is what the interface looks like um and if you've never done anything like this before or you're not sure um, about it. There, there's nothing to be afraid of with it. Um, we have an awful lot of tools to assist people um, in both how to interpret the documents and how to how to use Zooniverse. Um, so you'll see consistently um, things, for example, you can go to our About page and check out about the team, but also see about uh, frequently asked questions. Um, we have a forum um a civil a civil war blue jackets talk forum where people um can ask questions or if they're not sure about things um they can they can leave them here and they can also point us in the direction of discoveries we run a post every couple of weeks on our blog on civilwarbluejackets.com um about citizen science discoveries where um people find information on muster sheets that we then go and research and write up um so kind of an instant um output um, but if we just go back after lots of testing, um, it was decided we had originally started that we would do, um, everybody would transcribe every detail of all the sailors, but we found that that was way too long. It took people too long to do that. Um, and, and so after we ran beta tests, um, and discussed things with Zooniverse, we broke down the workflows into different groups. So you can select, you can come into the homepage and you can say, I want to do people's names. I want to do their rank, where they're born, their occupation, whatever. And you click on it um, and it takes you in to the sheets that load up for you. Um, and as I was saying, we have lots of different resources to help you out. So we have a field guide here 
which tells you about transcribing the muster rolls, um, a 19th century text. Um, we have um, the fields you will encounter describing all the different fields that are on the muster rolls and what they were for. Um, we have common terms and abbreviations that you'll encounter to help you read the 19th century handwriting. Often when you know what the word might be, it helps you an awful lot. Um, so common state abbreviations, um, common abbreviations for rank. Um, we have a full list of vessel names that you'll encounter as well um, on the homepage. So all those type of resources are there. Um, there's also a tutorial, right? So that you can, you can do a tutorial that gives you an indication um, of what we want you to do. But the very first question you're always asked is, is there a date written at the top of the sheet? And that's just um, because it makes, us easy, makes it easier for us um, at the end of the day, if we if there is a day in there that says, for example, 30th of June, 1864, it makes it easier for us to track them. But in this instance, if we just look at this one, we're on names, it doesn't have a day, so we say no, and then you go to your next task. And this is the kind of meat of what we're doing. We're in the names column here. So your task is to draw a box around each name in the names column. And the reason we need to do this is because the information scientists, as I was saying earlier, are looking to train the computers. And in order for them to do that, to read this handwriting, they have to have parameters to know. So you are going to look here at this man's name and we can see his name is Thomas Myers, right? But the computer has to know where Thomas Meyer appears on this image. And so drawing the box around his name tells them to and allows them to tell the computer where the transcription you're about to put in is. Okay, so all you're doing is Thomas Myers. We've drawn our name, his name around the box, and it's Myers Thomas. And you're done. Um, and you just continue to do this down through the sheets. Um, the next man is Augustus Harrison. Um, I'll just do him. You draw your box, Harrison. Augustus, and continue in like manner. And if you're not sure, if you're not sure, is that Augustus um, or Augustus, you can highlight it and you can say, oh, I think that's unclear. And that for, so it, there's all these different tools that you can use. Um, and we have a, ca a capacity to put 50, there's usually less than 50 names on a sheet, very occasionally more than them, more than 50, but we have 50, the capacity to put 50 entries. We'll just pretend we've done all of the sheets. You go all the way through to the end and then you click done and it submits. And that's it. So most of the entries only take um, a few minutes. As I say, there's an awful lot of support um, that's there for them. Um, and we did take the decision that even though people weren't going to be doing line by line anymore because at the time, the full images are there so that you can explore these individuals um, yourself and see where they're from. Um, you see Maine, New York, all their birthplaces here. Um, managed to pick one of the only ones uh, that doesn't have an Irish guy on them. But again, this is going to be interesting um, for, for individual vessels. And so all of these are, are going to be taken afterwards and, if you like, re recomposed by the information scientists for that database. All right. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a very quick um, look at how Zooniverse works. If you want to keep in touch with what we're doing, as I say, we're putting an awful lot of material out on a consistent basis. We have our, a website as well, civilwarbluejackets.com, with the blog on it that has an awful lot of material. YouTube with consistent health videos and, and how to. Our last video, um, for example, it, our got, we started to do a series of guides to the record. So it was looking at pension files and Facebook and Twitter, obviously. And the key one for you, your friends, and all your family, particularly over Thanksgiving when you're trying to recover. Um, from the onslaught on the gobblers um, that is going to occur on Thanksgiving is the Zooniverse one. So I will leave it at that. Thanks a million. Well, um, that was amazing, Damien. It's, it's so interesting, you know, to see what information can be pulled out of 
you know, pieces of paper in a way you, you kind of forget, you know, thank God they were niggly and, and collected all of the information, you know, to get these individuals. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, 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 the way they could never have anticipated the way we would, we would be able to link them back together yeah. in, in, you know, 100 and whatever we are, 60 years later, which just yeah. makes them unbelievably powerful documents. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, those individual stories that you can follow up, poor Richard Dunphy, you know, losing the two arms. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. yeah. well, his pension file now um, is a very tough read. Oh. Very, very tough read. Um, like to he give you one young, example. I have to say, like in the photo, yeah. He, he was very young. So he, he ended up sadly... Um, with with that drinking problem, and he was in he was in California, um, and there were there were accounts of actually from his wife, but uh, um, that he, he would be taken out to play cards, and the men would take because he couldn't do it himself, he couldn't take the money out, and they would just take his pension money out of his pocket, but they they like they he had no way of seeing how much they were taking, and so they yeah. were taking loads off him, and oh, geez. yeah, it was it's it's terrible. It was a uh, really 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 hard and a lot of them had hard lives afterwards Mm -hmm. but you see interesting things so for example we've seen with some of the african-american men who served in the mississippi like some of them are staying in close contact with each other like 30 Mm -hmm. 40 years after in different places and things so there are interesting things Mm -hmm. going on and who's talking to who and who isn't talking to who and Mm -hmm. and things Mm -hmm. is uh is, is a really interesting element of it. Mm-hmm. So No, I mean, it's the whole thing is fascinating because I, I thought, you know, you were only concentrating on the Irish, but the fact that it, those muster rolls, of course, has everyone. So, you know, yeah. the first thing is to, to get them all transcribed and then later on you can do searches, you know, within groups, I presume. <clears throat> no, no, this is it. And, and, and yeah. I mean, it will be a big thing to be able, we'll be able to compare. Like, mm-hmm. so we know, for example, that African-Americans were the worst treated in the Navy, right? They were really mm-hmm. badly treated, um, even though it was an integrated service. It, it, so the army wasn't integrated. It was segregated. Mm-hmm. The Navy, you would be serving, um, African-American men would be serving with Irish men um, and, and, and so on. But actually, mm-hmm. the degree to which it was truly integrated is, is open to some question, I think. Um, yeah. And it, but it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see, for example, the promotion rates. We know African Americans found it difficult to get promoted um, through mm-hmm. those lower ratings. Mm-hmm. Comparing them to say the Irish, to say the Germans, to the Scandinavians, to the British, it will be interesting, you mm-hmm. know. Absolutely, and the occupations yeah. that they all have and things is going to is going to be interesting because we'll be doing yeah. it for thousands of men. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, they talk about that later on in World War One and World War, you know, particularly World War One, but even World War Two, like that African American soldiers are, you know, cleaning the toilets and in yeah. the mess halls and stuff. Like they're not given the other jobs, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, it's I mean, and it, well, there is a serious. War, you know? Yeah, but yeah, well, it actually it actually regresses from the Civil War. Um, even even in, like it regresses very badly, actually, mm-hmm. um, from from what was in the Civil War. But you do see like certainly from what we've looked at in the Mississippi, you see mm-hmm. significant issues in relation mm-hmm. to racism, which is not surprising. Yeah. Um, and a, un, an unwillingness we've we've uncovered in some of some white sailors to give evidence in relation to African-American sailors mm-hmm. afterwards. But again, that tight knit um, yeah. element between the African-American guys themselves. themselves so. Yeah. And we don't know if that's going to be different. One of the other things, and I didn't mention it so much, is, you know, there are different fleets operating. There's a North Atlantic blockading squadron, South Atlantic blockading squadron, there are Gulf blockading squadrons, and there's people on the Mississippi and inland waterways. So mm-hmm. what differences are there between them? You know, mm-hmm. it's a, the, the, so, so really it's going, to be, it's going to be interesting to see all that come out. And, Jamie, like what happened? I, I forget what the landlubber category was um but La- landsman 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 yeah. yeah so like you know this 16 year old boy probably his second or third job you know he may or may not have worked as a kid you know shining shoes in the yeah. street or something would you enlist and are you just like you know making the tarps and uh, what do you do on the show oh you're you a you're a complete yeah you're crunch, a complete like, dog's body yeah, yeah. yeah you'll be given yeah. all the, the the horrific jobs because you have no skills yeah. So the um, like landsmen was what they would usually um, even so so interestingly, an African American if they were even if they were an experienced sailor would almost always only be enlisted as a landsman, for example. Wow. So that was one indication of 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 um, of discrimination against them. They were often enlisted actually as boys, which is oh. the lower one, again. Mm-hmm. But um, 
yeah, so really very, very little. So, so the, you can almost guarantee um, if a guy had previous maritime experience, he's going to come in at, at something like um, ordinary seaman or seaman level, mm-hmm. that they, 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 they tended to come in at that. And they were guys who were given a bit of responsibility and telling the others what to do. But really in this period, and like most of the vessels that are constructed, all of the vessels that the US Navy itself constructs during this period are, are primarily steam driven. So even though mm-hmm. there's still a lot of sail around, uh, one of the really important um, areas of the ship is the engine room. And that's where you're seeing mm-hmm. these guys, the coal heavers, who are literally yeah. the guys sh- shoveling the coal um, yeah. and the firemen who, who are who are down in the bowels of the ship all the time um who are doing that and you you get quite a bit of irish in that because Mm -hmm. a lot of them might have had some experience Mm -hmm. um in kind of factory settings Mm -hmm. in urban settings of doing that that sort of thing so again and we'll be seeing that we'll we'll hopefully see that divisions coming up like where are irish guys from new york being put versus irish Mm -hmm. guys from philadelphia is there a difference what 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 roles are they in Mm -hmm. so um, or if there was urban Irish for, who might have had that kind of experience versus like the farmers, you know, what are they yes. able to do, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, and and there are these little discrete groups like the oyster men. Like I didn't know about the Irish oyster men in Philadelphia. Mm. <laughs> so, so like, uh, and they weren't and just Irish, but there's a group. Go in together, you know, like they enlist together. Yeah, well, one of the yeah. files suggests that, um, no, and it's been a while since I read it. The thirty or forty of them send are sent west of that, yeah. like the group who, who go. I think we talked so, about this before. That you often see like a group of maybe friends or whether yeah. I don't know, like a, a baseball team or something that they must talk about it over like a weekend or a holiday, and they all go down together to enlist at the same time. Yeah, you know? this they, they, mm-hmm. they do. They do. You, you see it. You see it a bit less in the navy than in mm-hmm. the army. I think out of urban. A non-marine people, if you yeah. if, if you know, so so, so like I, I have a few letters from Navy Irish guys, and there was one young lad, um, who was delighted because he 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 says he he's writing back to his mother saying he found someone from her home place in oh, Ireland on the yeah. ship, so they had something to talk about, you know, yeah, even yeah. though I, he had never been there himself, but yeah. um, but but that kind of relationship, so you yeah. you you, but they do coalesce like. Mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. the sim, it's the same today isn't it it's a similarity yeah, so yeah. So, yeah. so those sort of co- but what makes the ship so interesting um even in 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 in, in relation in, in, over the army is just the the fact that it's a kind of an inescapable community in mm-hmm. a m- small metal box or wooden box yeah. that are yeah. together for like weeks and months on end yeah. often really monotonous um periods of time Mm-hmm. And and so so all of this, like I mean, the court martial records are available as well, of course. So oh, so yeah. we've all like and there's this, this flogging, whole, isn't there at this point still? They they don't they don't they don't do too much of that. What the main oh. one is, um, the main one would be, be being thrown in in um irons, oh, the, case, the brig, yeah, 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 yeah. So so um, I, again, a, a good example from an Irish one of of a guy. He answered back. He was sewing on a Sunday on the ship, and you weren't supposed to be doing any of that. Um, for religious reasons, and the officer challenged him, and the Irish sailor answered back to him, because mm-hmm. obviously the Irish sailor wasn't up to view; she wouldn't be doing anything like that on the Sunday. Yeah. Um, and he was he was clapped in clapped in irons. <laughs> so that yeah. was that was his that was what he got for it. And Charlie, um, you'd you'd do that just to stave off the boredom, nearly, you know, even though it was just yeah, technically work. Yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. So so much like, for I separation mean, of church and state. <laughs> There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, it's a, it's a, a and I mean, and they, you, you would often read about how it had to be that way, but uh, like yeah. captains and, and senior officers, like were dictators on vessels because oh, like, you yeah. couldn't have it any other way, but uh, yeah. the regular services on Sundays and things would be, um, would often be enforced, Wrong. but yeah. like you get this whole spread, like it, I would encourage people, anybody who's seeing this, like go and have a read of our last, um, mm-hmm. citizen scientist discoveries post, because that gives you the most typological, what the image of a sailor was in the 19th century. The guy lied about everything. He was leaving <laughs> um, wives all over the different states. Oh um, completely like was yeah. putting this image out. He's the classic sailor. Um, and it all came up because um, one of our citizen scientists discovered his name as having escaped from another vessel and was curious about these five guys. And then we started looking at him and it was just wow. this 
awesome yeah. amount of information. Had been in the Confederate Army. <laughs> wow, and then how convenient the. Yeah, yeah, yeah could be. Could, well, he seems to have accidentally he, he he accidentally got trapped on a Union vessel, um, when oh. the Confederates took back the town he was living in in Texas, and so he didn't have much choice but to stay on the, the Union. <laughs> yes. But he and he but he never went home again. He left his wife and kids there, went oh uh, never went back to his, and then had another family, another family entirely, and it all came out thirty years later because his oh huge file is there, yeah. and I told all these lies about serving in different in the Mexican American War and making That's rope ladders nice. for siege attacks and none of it ever happened yeah. <laughs> but he's the quintessential sailor so you get yeah. them as well so it's yeah, a really yeah. interesting mix um well, because and I was going to say, even the bread and butter guys like or you know it's just interesting what possesses a 16 year old from philadelphia you know or yeah yeah no exactly exactly yeah 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 like it's, it's, wonder... it's all driven by the huge expansion like the navy has virtually no ships really to speak of that are capable of doing what they need to do in the war yeah. and, and they need to hugely increase their sailors so they're just going yeah. straight come on boys mm. yeah. yeah yeah and there's no yeah. officially there's no press ganging i suppose you know or how does that work not officially there isn't <laughs> no not so that would be not officially but like similar to the army there certainly was some malpractice yeah, in relation to yeah. yeah in relation to recruitment mm -hmm. um but it, there was good incentives as well for guys like if you lived in a city where there was a, a naval agent you could get you could get a, a thing where a proportion of your pay was consistently paid out to your dependents which you couldn't get mm -hmm. if you're in the army mm -hmm. right so and you could get advanced pay as well sometimes and also there was the attraction of bounty money so if you captured a confederate blockade runner those very fast vessels that were trying to get supplies through the, the u.s blockade into the into the south um you, you got to share the prize choice. money yeah, yeah it's divided up so there were a lot yeah. of it and of course the biggest attraction and they talk about this in the letters is you get killed in the army like yeah. you had a very yeah. you did have a very low chance of being killed in the navy the okay. disease was a major player but but the, yeah. the, 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 the figures don't kind of there's no comparison really between the figures of mortality yeah, yeah. in the Standing army and the navy. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Were the demon in terms of like I, I loved that you preserved our sensibilities and skipped over the the illness thing, but I presume like that is syphilis and stuff that these men are getting at ports because there must have been yeah. more access to prostitutes. In yeah, there's a lot. It, there you see an yeah. awful lot of uh, sexually transmitted diseases among them. Yeah, definitely it's because amazing. they go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 they go on. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. Surely you like or something. <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, not, not speaking of, speaking about it. You know where I was talking to people's relatives, and you're going to go to oh, don't you don't want to say it and <laughs> what's I in know. the file, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, it does occur. It does occur. Yeah. Places like New Orleans and stuff like this in the, in the war, because when they're getting off on yeah. on leave, they they tend to go on complete benders. Like, yeah. Um, I have a, a we came across a letter once of a, a woman. She was actually from just outside Boyle in Roscommon. A letter landed through her door in Boyle telling her that her husband had died. He'd been killed in the Irish Brigade, wounded, mm. I think at, he'd been wounded at Malvern Hill. And that her son, who, who was in the Union Navy, had been in New York and had gone on a spree. They nearly always called it a spree. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and when he was coming back to the boat, had fallen down the hatch and killed himself. Oh, so, no. So she got the letter that from from um, a nephew, I think it was, that was relating both these deaths to her at the same time. Yeah. So that showed you the dangers of it. Um, yeah, yeah. But ever and present throughout, throughout. Exactly, and like seasickness must have been terrible, particularly for the landlubber ones that hadn't the yeah, legs. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if you, especially if you were being sent off, like off some of the waters off North, North Carolina and stuff. Yeah. Like there were some significant dangers. You know, you would come across. Um, you know, things like leaks in the boiler and the steam would escape. Like some of the most horrific kind of things Over that you would, injuries would be this, yeah, yeah, the steam burns. It could sometimes yeah. wipe out nearly an entire ship. But mm -hmm. the seasickness, a lot of the guys who, who end up going down kind of Florida and the Gulf, like there's things like malaria and yellow fever and stuff like that, or just like because they're sitting on these decks, sometimes in these iron hulls yeah. in blistering heat. Um like the complaints of things like the monitor is a very famous, the USS monitor is a very famous vessel, but like there was a whole class of vessels called the monitor after that. And and you hear guys complaining about that, for example, about the water and the constant damp and the wet. And they were even trying to give people more money to go onto those boats because, know. you know, 
um, yeah. they, they they weren't popular. So so like there's all there's all those different elements of where you got sent. So at, by the same token, you could have been one of the guys who was sent off to the Pacific or something. So, so there's them as well. Like during the Civil War, yeah. they're off on the other side of the world still. So yeah, they're yeah. really interesting mix. And uh, Bob said, you know, the it's a still a, a common practice today with police files, like to look for scars or deformities or tattoos. You know, so it was an interesting marker. Yeah. Um, and I think it is one of the things why they become so they do it a bit. Uh, they do it a, a bit kind of in the mid play, in certain places like so New York are doing it in the summer of eighteen sixty three at the rendezvous. You you see it on most of the uh, most of the muster sheets that we've seen so far from late in the war have them. And I suspect it's because they're concerned that these guys are going to jump ship like bounty yeah. jump the same as they do in the army. So they're yeah. they're just making sure that they have as much. Information, information is possible to identify yeah. them because they don't trust yeah. them um, mm-hmm. for for good or ill. So yeah, yeah, I think I think he's right there. It's a, it's very similar. So hopefully, you know, this will encourage people to go online now. It, do, when like if they do want to do this transcribing, they have to kind of register with ye and then tell you what ones they're going to work on. Or you no, know, you can no, just go to the site and kick yeah. and off you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Pretty, pretty much do what I did there, and you're yeah. away doing it. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah. so, so I mean, and the, the kind of depending on whatever you're interested in, whether it's the names or the ranks or, or, or yeah. enlistment or anything. So, mm-hmm. and you know, it doesn't. People are often concerned about making mistakes and stuff in this, but there's um, people shouldn't be worried too much about that. Aside from the assistance that's there, there, there's a one of the things that these projects have built into them is a kind of a it's called a retirement count. So, okay. so the way that they mitigate against um, errors is that the same thing is done by different people. So they, yes. and there's a bunch of different people are all doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, so and if so we all agree it, that it's Gerald instead of Gerald, you know, yeah. 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 Four people say it's Gerald and one people say it's Jerry. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's you, you can see the probability of what it is. So yeah, yeah. Uh, and you kind so, of get to recognize the swirls and you know the, the handwriting oh, of that. It'll grow on you. you. <laughs> Yeah, mm-hmm. it's amazing how quick, isn't it? It's amazing how fast you, you get used to it. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I think the abbreviation things, knowing, you know, in looking, advance, you, yeah, can, what those you might are. be looking at LDS for ages, but it, mm-hmm. and if you don't know that there's a rating landsman, you, you might know that that's what it says. But if you do know there is, like, yeah. it, it 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 makes a big big difference. Yeah, to have and that when, kind of key of terms. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. And now, yeah. will you just clear up for me, Damien? I think you said to go down the line like so just do names you don't have to go like to elizabeth stack her age her address her you no. go down elizabeth then on exactly yeah 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 okay. yeah so you do the full column. you do the full sheet of names mm-hmm. and then you, you could choose to do the next one if you want ages or something but it, it'll probably be a different sheet you know because yeah. the, the one that'll give you up um yeah so um because originally we have been doing that, but it it was taking so long to do a yeah. single sheet if people were going across that it, that it wasn't yeah. practical. So, um, yeah. yeah, but you can do the names and check the, the ages. Some of the are empty, actually, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. no, and that's it. And you get some variance. There's about five different types of muster sheets, and sometimes mm-hmm. the sometimes they were just too lazy to fill them up, <laughs> mm-hmm. or sometimes they 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 ran out of sheets and just created these short ones. So, mm-hmm. um, and people flag them with us. So when you're in Zooniverse. And you find something interesting on a sheet, you can actually send a sheet directly to the forum, the talk forum, and talk about it there and say, mm-hmm. oh, this is interesting, or this one has more than 50 names on it. Um, mm-hmm. So there, there's there's a whole series of hashtags people have going on the forum and everything as well already for, for different types of, of uh, information. Okay, good. Well, uh, John Faye says he wanted to just say hi to you. He's back. Hi, He's hey, John. Hope oh, all is good. <laughs> yeah. He said I met him 10 years ago or so when I lived in Dublin. He, you were just yeah. getting started then, David. Yeah, I remember you know. it well. I remember oh, it well. Yeah. Well, I don't know how you, the time, the amount of work that you do on all of these different projects. And, we, you know, we had you on for Vinegar Hill and the, the archaeology too. It's, uh, you know, you, you're it's, making it's me embarrassed at how much <laughs> work you do. Oh, no, well, this this one this one is my full-time my full time one now. This is great. Okay, uh, the, yeah, the, yeah. Na- the, Navy, the Navy guys are getting getting all, all my attention during the okay. day. <laughs> it's, good, good. They're, uh, yeah, well, they're, you know, so definitely, you know, I think it's a great, just an hour, you know, here and there. You don't have to spend hours and hours at it. But exactly. you know, if you had nothing else to do and you wanted to click online and 
just transcribe exactly. it to the names. Yeah. It's great. You can do some of the shorter ones in just a handful of minutes. Uh, they're, yeah. they're very quick and it just gets yeah. quicker the more you do it. So Yeah. And then, as you said, you know, just to go in and enjoy what's already up there is so fantastic too. This is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would encourage people to have, you, you really get a sense of the type of material that's coming out on the blog. Like you just see this, you know, we yeah. have some stuff about different occupations now um, that are coming out of the project. And yeah, you know, yeah. th- a lot of stuff about African-Americans um, is is emerging. That's really, really, it's just fascinating on any Absolutely. level. It's nothing to do really even with the military, but just really fascinating yeah. life stories. And as you said, the fact it. that they were keeping in touch, you know, it just shows you how like when the community breaks down in one way, or if they were enslaved people fleeing, you know, that they yeah. had to recreate their own kind of new community bonds. No, exactly. Uh, you know, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and and some of them are given information, you know, that um, they, they, they're, they end up giving information there that would be completely missing because, you know, they were enslaved. So in the 1860 census, they weren't named. They were yeah. just get their sex and age was given. Wow. But we have guys who were going on to some of those city class iron uh, uh, um uh, ironclads that we were looking at and the information they're given is unbelievable like they're yeah. scarred from bloodhounds that oh. have been mauling them after escape attempts oh, um yeah. their wife fleeing with them and uh, staying on coal barges being towed by the U- union navy down the the, the river and stuff it's mm-hmm. absolutely incredible mm-hmm. um information that yeah. just wouldn't be there otherwise. yeah absolutely yeah 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 well it's particularly people like that that fall through the cracks yeah, so look, hopefully, so. you know, you'll all be interested. And Damien gave the um, website address. We'll probably put that in the description on our Facebook uh, cool. post about it, it, you know, and, and our website and the YouTube channel just to click into their website. But thank you very much, Damien. We'll definitely hold you to a talk on Gettysburg in July. Oh, I look forward to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in yourselves. And happy Thank Thanksgiving everybody. to everyone. I think we're not, are we finished for the week? We are, I think, yeah. Next week we're back on the 29th time interviewing Colin Tobin. So we'll be doing that live on Zoom at seven o'clock. And then on the 1st of December, we've Dr. Catherine Bates and her new book is Irish Civil War Songs. Um, I might have that name wrong of the book, but it's about the Irish Civil War, American Civil War songs. So that'll be a, a great talk. And the book is Associate available. Associate editor of Irish and American Civil War website as well. Is she? Yeah. She is. And we have your yeah, book yeah. in stock, actually. Uh, the oh, Hidden please. Irish. Yeah. We've forgotten a few Irish, yeah, yeah. Of the Forgotten <laughs> Irish. Yeah, I just came in the other day a couple of copies. So um, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, I know. We're, so anyone looking for Christmas presents, we'll have our Christmas market on the third of December, and they'll all be available there. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks very much, Damien, and good night to everyone. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>